next episode. Yo, I'm Devin Reed, and I'm on a mission to build a bigger and more inspired career as a marketer, creator, and entrepreneur. I've spent 10 years in sales and marketing, become head of content for $2 billion tech companies, and scaled my side hustle, The Reader, to six figures. And now, I'm ready to level up my creativity and earning power to hit the next level. Let's ride. But I need more than tips, tricks, and dopamine hits. I want inspiration and expertise that's gonna help me reach my potential. And damn it, I wanna have fun doing it. So I'm traveling America for candid, street-level conversations about creativity, marketing, and playing by your own rules. You'll hear the stories behind the success, unfiltered conversations, vulnerable moments, and practical advice to help you grow your career, confidence, and income. Are you ready? This is Read Between the Lines, the show for people who want to achieve phenomenal results. Welcome to my show. If I'm being honest, I'm a little nervous for today's conversation. And that's because I'm meeting Doug Landis. He's an absolute legend in the industry. Doug got his start in sales, moved to chief storyteller at Box, one of the world's most famous and successful tech companies. And now he's a growth partner at Emergence Capital. And while it's easy to sit down with Doug and ask him how he built his career, there's already other podcasts that cover those topics. What I'm really interested in is the man behind the legend and the stories and experiences that made him who he is today. We're gonna have an inspiring conversation that will entertain and help you be a better professional. Are you ready? Let's ride. So to kick things off, we're gonna do things a little bit different on this episode. So you're the only, so I'm grateful. You're the only one on the show so far I have not met first. Wait. And I don't take that for granted. So we were thinking, man, what could we do to make this episode a little bit more special? Great. And I have learned that you are a level two sommelier? Level one. Level one level sommelier. One. Yes. So we thought we'd break something out a little bit special for you. Oh, come on. It's a 2017 Opus One. And we're gonna drink this together on the show if you're down. Fuck yes. Yeah? Absolutely. What year are we talking here? My, uh, my director and friend David was the one who pulled the trigger for us and he sourced it. So I, I will have to ask him. You know, remember the year? Well, yeah. They only had 27. I that's heard a, it was your favorite year. year. It's a good year. It's a good year. 2017 is good. Here's, here's the thing with most restaurants. I actually put together a little, a little doc on, um, uh, on like how to order wine at a restaurant. It's tips for people that don't know, nor, normally know how to, that aren't real wine savvy. Um, and they're trying to figure out how to order what bottle. Yeah. Cause here's the, by default, you never want to order the most expensive. You also never want to really order the cheapest. Yeah. What do you choose? And everyone's like, well, it depends on what you're eating. I agree with that. There is some truth to that yeah. because you know, like the reason why you drink a big cab with a steak is because the fats in the steak cut through the cut through the, the tannins in the cab, right? Yeah. The cab's big wine. You drink it on its own like this, and it's like, woof, that is a meal. A lot going glass, on. Right? There's a lot going on. Drink, you drink this, pair it with a steak, starts to break it, softens it, makes it real nice. Real nice. We gotta get this guy steak. Can we order steak? No, I don't want steak. <laughs> I'm, 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 good. Te I'm <laughs> teasing you. I'm teasing you. I love that though. Oh, anyway, so my tips. So first and foremost, everyone, you start with a white. When you sit down at a restaurant, start with a glass of white. Okay. It's fresh. It's kind of a little bit of a palate cleanser. Um, it eases you into the meal, into the night. And also, okay. typically, if you're going to order appetizers, they tend to be a little lighter. If it's sure. a salad, if it's a little crudo or something, yeah. white wine pairs better. Oysters with usually with the apps. You're not getting big, heavy apps or like meatballs right. unless you're at an Italian restaurant. Sure. Then you always want to like have a Pinot Pinot that you like that is from a particular region. There's a bunch of different regions. Like there's St. Lucia Highlands, which is, happens to be my preference. There's Santa Barbara. Um, there's of course Napa, there's Sonoma Coast, sure. there's Willamette Valley, right? It's kind of like five big regions. Pick the one that you like, cause they're all a little different. So now you're like meal time. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna order a main, like a protein. Typically everyone looks at you, especially if you're on a date, you're like, ooh, I'm gonna go get a big Napa cab. It costs you like 300 bucks. You're yeah. like, Oof. I don't even know what to get. Here's the problem. Most of the Napa cabs that are on most restaurant menus are too young. What's the cutoff age? So like, this is 17. This is, I wouldn't go any younger than this. Okay. I mean, like I like older. So I'm thinking 2012 to 2017. Of course, it's more expensive as it's older. Sure. So you gotta be ready for it. But the problem is you go get a 2019, 2020, 2021, which is what they're selling right now. It's yeah. only two years old. You go to drink and it's not ready. tight. It's not ready. So here's your tip. There's three different wines you can order instead of the big baller Napa cab and it's cheaper. One, 
Rioja Reserva from Spain. Usually there's one or two of them on the menu. When you order it, the, the, the waiter or the psalm will look at you and be like, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, nobody orders these unless they know what they're doing. I'm excited for that look next time I go to order one because I'll have Doug <laughs> in my you know, little, like the angel devil shoulder, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, and I'll yeah, have yeah, Doug totally. over here like, yeah, well, order the you, this, you would order this and you'd be like, cool, good choice. You know, like, But yeah. then if you go like, no, I'm going to have that Rioja Reserva. You know, you know. Shout out to David. I was just like, we got to do something. He's like, this is the one. So we, we found it. This is great. This is a great way to start. I'm, right. glad, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> so I'm glad I get to share this with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And David, we were saving some for you as well. Cheers. He was like, I get some, right? And I was like, dude, of uh, yeah, course. Yeah, I've got to drive. So like, yeah, yeah you're good. A whole you got, you'll get to Chase keep this. Getting I get some. this. We're all going to have, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to, you know. a little celebration. Yep. Yeah. All right. So the next thing, I'm glad you enjoyed this, <clears throat> is not the uh, intended opening topic which was I'm in, uh, I'd say the green room, which is the back room. I'm getting, I'm getting dressed and you go, wait, hold on a second. You're changing? I thought we were doing <laughs> tattoos out. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, let's go. Ink so out. I was uh, not, not surprised, but like you've got more than I would expect. Yeah. So are these newer? Are these, well, have you these, had them for these a bit? Actually, interestingly enough. I need to know um, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, totally. This one right here. You choose. You choose. Choose you. These are new. These are they look a little two fresh. weeks old. I was gonna say they they're look. Two, fresh. They're still they're still like peeling a little bit. They're like two weeks yeah. old. Yeah. Um. My my word for twenty twenty four is choice. Like it. Um. We all get we all have choice in our life in every situation. Even though we feel like a lot of times we don't really have control uh, over certain things, especially you know in in our professional lives, we are yeah. at the mercy of other people and whatever sure. whatever decisions they make. But we get to choose how we react, respond, and show up. Yep. And this is just a reminder, like you get to choose, but also don't forget to choose yourself because uh, if you don't, <clears throat> nobody else will. Like yep. you have to, you have to look out for yourself. I'm not saying being like a lot of people think selfish is a bad word. I think you got to have boundaries for yourself. Well, selfish is an important word yeah. because if you're not looking after yourself, nobody else is. Yep. Because a lot of us have a tendency of putting other people first. Is something happened last year to motivate choice to be the word of the year this year? Um, Oh, you have no idea. I was saying, and I'm going to go deep. I'm going to, I'm going to test you, you a little no bit. Idea. So you're allowed to pass and we can you, cut or uh, you can go into it. So if you don't want to talk about it, we just go to the next tattoo. We're just going to say 2023 was the hardest year of my life. I will, I will absolutely without going into my own stuff, confirm. I was telling the, the team before this, I said, I was very blessed, lucky, whatever word you want to call it. 2020, 2021, 2022 were great years for me, despite the pandemic and everything. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. 2023 shattered a lot of, dude. you know, I would say, speaking of choice, mine was like control, realizing how little control I have. And so, so that, it, so I, I respect, I respect having an experience as you see on me yeah. that leads to a tattoo and in an in intentional lifestyle for the yeah. coming year. So I respect that a lot. Yeah. Control is actually really dangerous. I think we all think we have a lot more of it than we do. Oh, yeah. And the reality is, is it's usually what causes a lot of the challenges that we have in our life. Yeah. I just read an amazing <clears throat> book. You should check it out. Um, this guy named Mitch, uh, Mitch Singer. Uh, he wrote this book called Untethered Soul. It's really intense. It's, it's, it's a lot to read. It's all about consciousness and, and, and choice and how we're, you know, we are not our thoughts and our emotions. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't but we make think we are, are a lot. We no, feel we that feel way. Feel those. Yeah, we experience yeah. them, but that doesn't make us who we are. Yep. Well, um, and so that statement, I am is a really powerful statement. Mm -hmm. We got to be really careful about that. Um, versus I am fe like, I feel these things yes. versus I am these things. Yep. Right. But then he wrote another book called the surrender experiment, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend okay. because it's a reminder of, uh, of how little control we really have and how mm -hmm. like our ultimate experience in life is to continue to learn how to surrender to what the universe has in store for you yep. because the reality is is you never really know yeah right and we yeah. try and control things when we try and control things and when they don't show up or, or 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 they don't land the way we think then we get disappointed yep and and it's and so it's like but why, why do you want to be disappointed i just want to be yeah. i want to try and be as present as possible and and to do that i gotta i gotta let go mm -hmm. um and and it's funny the word I was using is kind of detached, but that feels a little negative. But surrendering is is a really powerful word. I like the word detached. I use that a lot. Yeah. And it's tough because when you know I started in sales, it's very hard to be a detached in a sales job because you are a number. I don't care what anyone says. You are at the end of the day a number on a spreadsheet. Yep. And 
a lot of times, at least at least for me, I'm sure you can tell me if you you know if you've experienced it, is your worth to the company is the number, and therefore you look at it as the worth of yourself. Yeah. And so if you miss quota, if you have oh. a bad quarter, if you're like me and you've been laid off on the first day of the new year. I've been walked into the office, got fired at eight o'clock, and I was walking back towards the bus. Everyone in downtown San Francisco walking toward work. No way. I'm already walking back Tail home. Tail between your legs. To find out a new, you know, yeah. a new gig. And so what I've been focusing on is detach, which to your point of like, I used to say this, but now I say that. I used to say, I don't care. Like, I'm not gonna care. But that's not really true. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. just to, you can care, yeah. but be detached from the emotions where you can control what you want, you know, what you can control. Yeah, and yeah. to your point, kind of let the universe unfold a little yeah. bit. Quit trying to control everything. Yeah. This is me talking to myself. But don't, but also, I mean, look, process what you need to process. Like that's going to be emotional yeah. when you get fired, let go, whatever. It's like, yeah. it's emotional. <clears throat> process that and let it go. Be like, yeah. okay, so this is not my place anymore. Yeah. You know, there's something else for me out here and I just need to, I need to have this experience and know that this isn't me and I'm going to release it and move on and, and, yeah. and go on to whatever is in store for, for me next. Um, it's hard to do. And you're, you're really sure. right. You know, it's really interesting I, to me, the distinction between, you know, you are the number mm -hmm. versus you are, you know, an employee here that we care deeply about is it all comes from leadership. Yeah. It comes from the leadership. And to be honest, it, it comes from like, unfortunately it comes and I've been spent the last seven years in VC. It kind of comes from us as investors really? and it goes to the board and then it goes to the executive team and then it goes to the frontline team and then it goes all the way down to ICs. Right. Yep. And, and it's, there's a lot of people involved that influence the I am. Mm -hmm. Right. And so being able to kind of detach yourself and recognize, yes, I, I do have a responsibility for a number. Sure but that is not who I am. I am a sales yeah. professional and I'm trying my best. I, I, I posted today about the fact like, hey, look, in, especially in sales, there's a lot of things that are out of, out of your control. And it's like, if you've done everything you can and still somebody has, like they're out in the rain driving and they're on their way to like, you know, close a deal with you and they get into an accident, all of a sudden your deal doesn't matter anymore. Dropped on the priority list by 10. <laughs> Right, and that and that is one of a million things that yeah. can happen in, in a given day, which is also why you want to try and get things done before the yeah. last day. Don't like, wait until right now. You don't want to wait until the very last. Yeah. I mean, you know, and because you, you end up looking desperate or trying hail mary stuff, which really doesn't work yep. most of the time, and you kind of you, and you lose some of your soul when you do that. You know, uh, like uh, yeah. uh, I'm doing, doing this because I'm doing this because I'm trying to hit the number. <laughs> I was gonna say like when I left when I moved from sales to marketing. It was like a couple of things where it was like that that was one where I'm like I'm I'm doing things and saying things that I don't believe in yeah. because I'm being pressured to do so and that's not it goes back to choice like you have a choice you can listen I'm just going to say the sales manager who's telling you get on the freaking phone yeah. do this say this and get it done yeah. and there's those times where you're like I know that's not going to be the thing yeah. that gets it done but I'm either insubordinate and not trying not a team player yeah or you sell a little bit of your soul and you go do it and now sometimes it does pan out but it is that choice to your point. But here's the thing with your with your manager, you got to have that relationship to be like, "Hey, do you trust me?" And and that's only that's no. only well, but that's only <laughs> built over that's built over time of of doing yeah. what you say you're going to do, putting yep. in the work. Don't giving me ex don't give me excuses like, "Oh, well, you know, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, you're like, you're not updating Salesforce because uh, like 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 yeah. do the do if you do the job." Yeah. You know, you're going to build that trust and that relationship. So now if I look at you and you're like, this is not how it's going to play out. Yeah. I'm willing to reach out, but I'm just telling you. Right. And, and I tell you what, based on what happens, we're going to discuss that and we're going to use this to build right. on. Right. Yeah. But that's the level of conversation that people, uh, that it takes some maturity to have. I was say, I was early in my career. No, you're, you don't even know better. You're like, they said to do it. So yeah, I so did it. it. And then you <laughs> yeah. realize this is not good. Yeah. Yeah. It Later. It doesn't feel right. doesn't like, feel uh, right. But you kind of push that down because you're like, I guess this is sales. Like, yeah, I guess yeah, this yeah. is what we do. <laughs> and then later. We the, follow instructions. The, yeah. You follow an order. And then later you like, you know, you, you have some success. And so you kind of have a leg to stand on, you know, yeah. and then hopefully I was in it for six years as, as an IC. And yeah, at the end, towards that, you know, year five, six, yeah, I can have the conversation. You look the VP in the eye and go, I don't believe in this. Yeah. And, and here's why. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, look, it's kind of like, I'll do it. And I've said it even now in my marketing leadership career, like, I do not agree. I don't believe in this. But if you're telling me to stack hands and do it, I will do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's obviously yeah, yeah. different in a marketing capacity versus like a one-to-one -one sales conversation. Yeah. But it does take, I think, maturity 
it takes time to just build up that confidence to look someone who's done it for 20 years. Like imagine me yeah. Doug, looking at you like, Hey, I hear you, but no, like that's a tough uh, yeah. thing. Like, Dude, and, and you'd be, and like, be hey, like, Hey, I hear you. I and hear yes. you, but yes, <laughs> you know, you got to trust me because I've been doing this a lot longer. And, and so like it is, it, it totally is a balance. Yeah. It is absolutely a balance. I think it's also how it's approached. The, yeah. I think one of the things that like at least Gen Z has taught me is like, we, we have to be really thoughtful about our approach and mm -hmm. how we approach the conversation. And I think we need to be really thoughtful about like, people just want to be seen. They want to be For seen sure. and they want to be heard. And it's like, okay, I hear you. you I need you to hear me. Yep. So it goes both ways. Yeah. And then we can just talk about like, look, doing this a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, let's try this. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, let's talk about it. Right. And then we'll try something else. Right. So, yeah. But oftentimes I'm feeling the pressure. I'm like, dude, I don't have time to do all this with you. Like, D, I just needed to get to do this. There, yeah, there's a time like, and a place. There's times and places when I'm like, dude, just do it. Like, when, it when it's January 31st and the quarter's ending, yeah. not always the best time to have these like big hearts to hearts, but, no, no. but they are important. Um, mm -hmm. Something I want to talk to you about, and I'm, cur I'm genuinely curious, is when, when Doug Landis, the name is brought up. <laughs> I'm not oh. saying this to stroke your ego. Oh. The tone changes a little bit. I think there's an air of respect. Why? I don't know. I'm finding out right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning right now. But I'm, I'm, my bridge is like you're talking about things you can control. Mm -hmm. And you have a very specific reputation. What is it? I would say it is of can, the words here. Let me just say the words that I have here. Connector. Really knows his shit. And... I've, it's, I'm kind of adding this word, but like mentor, but you've mentored in very interesting ways. I don't even know if you've realized. And so there's a lot of respect around like this guy gets it. He's earned his stripes. But I think you have an ear to the ground for the younger generation that a lot of people who've been in the game as long as you don't have and don't mm. care to have. And so it's this interesting dynamic of kind of no matter your age or maturity level or how many years in the game you've been, Doug Landis has like some like you should like kind of be quiet and listen for a second. Uh, that's cool. How does that resonate? Like, does that feel accurate to you? Does it feel like I'm, I'm bullshitting you a little bit? Well, I tell you, the first thing that comes up is I'm like, I'm super grateful yeah. for that. Um, uh, and it and look, I, it, it does resonate. I, I don't like putting labels on things. Um, I care deeply about the world that we swim in, the world mm -hmm. that we live in, largely. Um, I, I'm, I, I am a connector. I love connecting. I love connecting people. And, and I think that is a superpower that I have. It's like, yeah. I, I like, oh, okay, I can see this and this and these things all go together. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's look, I mean, to, look, to be honest, if you want to get deep, I mean, this, this goes all the way back to, to my childhood where all of my family life wasn't all that great. And so my friends became my family. All of my friends mm. became my family. Your chosen family. And my chosen family. And as a result, Unfortunately, one of the skills that I developed is learning how to say the right things to the right people so that they didn't leave, mm. right? And also developing those relationships. But it also helped me to really understand people at a level because yeah. I needed to, I needed, mm. I needed a relationship there. I needed trust. I needed to yeah. know that they were gonna be there for me. Um, and I think that has just carried throughout my entire life. And it's kind yeah. of and it's evolved into this like this this connector ecosystem or ethos that I that I I operate with um but i also love it because i think there's so much value in making connections because yeah. oftentimes we just don't know what to look for and i like to be in the middle of it and be like cool i can help i can make that happen and i think all of that comes from a place of of just wanting to help yeah like i just have a sincere honest desire to help people and I tend to take way, way too many calls and meetings with people <laughs> who want to pick my brain or they like, they want yeah. like, a career conversation. And I'm like, sure, I'll, I'll take that. And you know, my wife a thousand times over is like, wow, you give up so much of your time and, and energy for free. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I feel like, I feel like I've been really blessed in this life and it's like, so I'm all about giving back. Well, I think that that's a big part of it is like you make deposits. You know what I mean? You're depositing into people and giving constantly. Um, that's, a, that's a good way to think about it. Which is, which is what I think draws people to you, 
right? It's easy to have, and, and I, I like to use this phrase, the outside looking in. I'm very aware of like what it seems like, because what it seems like is never what it is. Yeah. If, you look at totally. Doug Lance, you look at his LinkedIn, totally. you do a little totally. Google search and it's like, holy shit, this guy's got it all. This guy's <laughs> made it. He's a made man. I was, I was prepping, I was like, if tech was the mafia, he's a made man. Like he's, <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the perception. You know what I mean? I love and that. So I love that. I'm like. I don't always feel that way, by the way. I mean, and I, I think get it's, I think it's, I I think it's a little that. imposter syndrome, but it's just like, I am, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm just a, I'm a learner. I'm a seeker. Yeah. I mean, that's just part of me. It's like, I'm always wanting to learn and know more. Yeah. Well, let me get, can I give you an example? Yeah, please. So my, uh, my, my agent and, and business manager, Anish. Yeah. Do you remember what you said to him recently? Uh, I said something too, like if you are building a business around being a publicist, um, I said something like, I'm going to watch you. I think I'm going to watch you. And I'm like, if you are building this, because I live in LA right now and I, I finally understand what a pe publicist does for Hollywood yeah. actors. And I didn't know, honestly, I had no idea until I met one randomly sitting at a sushi restaurant. We were both working and I was like, what do you do? She's like, publicist. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. And she told what does that me. Mean? Yeah. And she told me and I was like, when, when John was telling me, and I think you work with him and, and mm -hmm. a couple others was telling me what he does. I'm like, oh, he's a publicist to mm -hmm. people who have a brand. Yeah. And I was like, that's cool because we need this yeah. in, in our domain. And so I reached out, I, I think I responded to him and I was like, I'm going to watch you because if I think you, you're doing what you say you're going to do or what, you know, some other people think yeah. you're going to do for them, then I might want in on this. But, I, but in, the, in the meantime, I'm going to watch. We'll yeah. see. And if it works, then I'm going to tell everybody about it. So I think he, something like it that. was, it was very similar, very, yeah. Okay. And so it was a email chain to, pre to get you here. Basically he was, you know, I said, you know, reach out to Doug, make sure he knows where to be. Yeah. And we By the way, I didn't really know him at all until like John told me about him. I was like, oh, all right, cool. So we get on a call. We have a weekly and, and, you know, we're like going through everything. Does everyone know where they're supposed to be? And we're like, you know, make sure we don't, we don't know you yet. So we're like, let's make sure we treat him good. Like, and you know, he's, <laughs> he's the guy. And he's like, yeah, man, he, he said something really interesting to me and his like tone changed. I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, he told me like he's watching me. And if basically I don't fuck this up, I'm really onto something. And he like those words that you told him that like lifted him up. Like That's you could awesome. tell it was this le it was this level of validation and yeah. confirmation that I'm like in my head, Doug's probably just a nice dude who kind of like ripped, you know, quick email like, hey, man, I see, you know, I see you. And if you're yeah. doing it right, what, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of uh, speculating here. But he was like, and he doesn't share like a lot about himself too much yet. And he was like, yeah, man, like. I struggled with imposter syndrome and Doug saying that like really lifted me up. That's cool. And so I wanted you to know that That's because cool. I have a feeling you do that stuff naturally and we don't yeah. always realize the impact that it has on somebody. Yeah. And so when I'm talking about your brand and it might sound like I'm just like stroking your ego, it's really not. It's like, I like to call that behavior out and like reward it and just like close the loop with you to be like, man, can we just like, cause keep doing it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like it, yeah, and it yeah. means a lot. So well, I thought it was cool. It is me. It's who I am. So I'm not going to change, but I, I appreciate that because I don't, you know, here's the thing. I, I don't do these things for any purpose other than to be helpful or just to share. You had nothing and, to gain and, from doing that. You know, and I, and I, and I don't, and I think, I think that's part of it is like, you know, when people ask me for an introduction or like ask me for a thought or they want to pick my brain or whatever, I'm like, okay. And I, I don't, I don't need anything in return. Mm -hmm. Um, because just that experience, just that exchange on its own is fulfilling enough. Fills your cup. Yeah. Fills your cup. Yeah. Do you need to fill on your glass? No, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Balance water, wine, water, wine. I have a problem where I start drinking wine and I stop drinking water because I'm like, this is way better. We, we all have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, I'll be clear. Yeah, I, yeah. I have not touched the water. It's, it's all the opus right now. The reputation is something that I take really seriously and kind of thing we're, we're like bouncing around. And so I'm curious, like... The, the the thing I I know when I Google when I Googled you and like what's this guy talking about so I don't talk about the same thing yeah the chief storyteller is the thing the trap <laughs> that yeah, I know you've oh answered gosh. a bunch everybody wants to talk about that so I, so I so I put in my notes and I went don't do that yeah good for you I but, appreciate that but, I like talking about it but it but it, but it's but it's it's been overplayed you can click those podcasts if you want that story this is not that podcast I'll yeah, just yeah. listen to my war, a warning to my listeners but the the thing for me is like reputation and building like what can you control we talked about like what control you control your reputation you can control your performance to a degree to a degree i think you can control how you treat people yes. and i think when you do that over time when you are successful 
right? It could be in your sales career. It could be helping people unsolicited. It could be in your my marketing career. Results and then treating people the right way is like that just compounds over time, over time. And that to me is what leads to longevity. I'm curious what your take is on this. Like, have you curated, like, it sounds like the things we're talking about kind of come natural to you, but I'm curious, is this something like you set out like in early in your career? Like, no. Yeah. What I did mean, you set out for? Cause you made like, and again, I'm not trying to like, oh, this guy made all this. No. I'm sure. And I want to talk about, you feel like you didn't make it. Cause we all feel like we all set a goal, hit the goal and then feel like we don't deserve the goal. I mean, I still, ha I still haven't made it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Like, what is that? What, like, I, you know, here's, here's the funny thing. Um, I fell into sales. I was all ready to go to law school. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. I was yeah. all ready to go to law school. And my father was a lawyer and he was like, let me tell you what being a lawyer is really all about. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then I was in college. I'm like, what am I going to do? Yeah. And so I spent like a year and a half at the career center. It's a really, it's a wild story. I don't, not too many people know this actually. So um, kudos to you for pulling this out. So I spent a year and a half in the career center and I was just like hyper focused on learning about how do I write a resume? How do I think about my career? Cause I wasn't going home, didn't really have that to go to. So it was kind of like, I'm on my own. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I'm a little bit of a hustler. So I'm like, well, this is on me now. So I got to figure this out. And so um, I spent a bunch of time. And fortunately I was, you know, I was in the Greek system and I was, you know, president of my fraternity and then vice president nice. of fraternity council. And, um, you know, I have a, I think it's just because I have a way of connecting with people. Um, and, and I was gonna use, I'm like, I've got access, so I'm gonna use this access to try and learn as much as I can so that I can at least be prepared to graduate. Cause I'm like, what am I gonna do, yeah. right? Um, by the way, consequently, after spending all that time and figuring, figuring this out, I went back to school for six months and helped kids figure out how to think about what to do in school to prepare you to yes, graduate because yes. no one thinks about that. And honestly, you got to yeah. be thinking about that in eighth grade. I'm hollering like, at my 16 year old brother right now. Oh, talking dude, about every decision you make yes, impacts the next your thing. opportunity. And even when people call me up and they're like, hey, I'm thinking about leaving. I know I'm jumping around, but hey, I'm thinking about leaving and I want to go do something else. I'm like, cool, whatever you're thinking about, how is that going to set you up for your yes. next job? Yes. And they're like, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I'm like, yeah. cool, that's what you need to go think about and then we'll talk. Yeah. Anyway, so I spent all this time at a career center. I get really good at packaging this experience that I've had and and articulating it in a way that is lo looks interesting to companies, and um, and then companies start coming in. I get really good at interviewing, and I and I basically end up as like the top candidate graduating. Everybody wants to hire, so I was like, cool. Well, we I, mean, I spent all, options. I also built all of the connections in the career center. So when right. when you know back in the day when like uh, you know. Uh, Accenture was coming and like, hey, who, what students should we get to know? They're all like, this guy, this guy. And mind you, my first couple of years in school, I did not do well. My last two years, I worked my ass off because I realized I'm like, okay, this is now in my hands. And and I, I I turned things around. Did the stakes set in? What changed at like midway through where you're like from from not so good to this... Well, I realized, I realized like, you know, the fun party life, I, I, I experienced that and I'm like, okay, it's time to time to move on and take and honestly yeah. it it happened being involved in the greek system and taking on responsibility of of like as president of, the, of my fraternity house i was like now i'm responsible if mm. someone gets hurt i get sued oh okay that that's what people don't know like the president <laughs> of the house gets sued i did not know that yeah and and guess what so i'm like oh all of you people getting all crazy no, yeah that, get yeah, off that. there don't do that don't yeah. do that right so i was that way and i realized i'm like i got some responsibility here so so i i, I graduate I get a job um, and I get a job working for Black & Decker. And I chose that specifically, selling power tools. So John Barrows and I both worked for DeWalt, Black & Decker. Right, yes. that's where y'all met? Isn't that crazy? No, we didn't meet there, but- Oh, I thought that's where that, you guys were at, yeah, yeah. No, but isn't that crazy that it we is both worked there? Like that's, that's, that's bonkers. I was there when we bought the brand and then John worked there a little later. Um, but so so I go there and here's, here's a wild story. So um, it was at the time where the job market was terrible. And 2020 was had this offshoot of a show called uh, shoot I can't remember the name um, I'll have to it'll come it'll come to me but Ron Reagan Jr. was the host and it was kind of like a offshoot of 2020 okay um, kind of a more hip modern version of it and uh, they were talking about the job market and they were basically highlighting all over the country how no one was landing jobs and there were parties all everywhere where people were reading their decline letters like parties oh yeah at bars and then they're like we need someone who's the 
success, someone who's made it and who got through all this and actually landed yeah. a job. And they came to me. Interesting. So this is one of the first TV shows that I was on. So they were like, cool, we want to come out and go through like a day in the life of you out in the sa out in sales selling power tools, power tool accessories. <laughs> what so was course, your response? Were you pumped or were you I like- I was like, hell yeah, come on out. <laughs> and I was getting trained and and they came out and they interviewed me and the guy was like, so what do you want to be when you, you, know, when you get older? And I was like, I want to be a US Senator. Really? Random. I think it was connected to the, the, the political side, science sure. degree that I had, wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I look on it now and I'm like, mm, I don't know if I would really want to do that. Too much, a lot of power, but too much influence. Yeah. Um, I say this because I kind of fell into sales because every test that I was taking was like, you should go into sales. And I was like, okay, I don't know anything about it. I think I might be good at it because I can talk to anyone at any yeah. point in time. Um, but I, but as a result, I kind of fell into it. I realized I, I loved it. I loved it. Um, I guess it's, it's one of those things like, I don't think of it, like, I just think sales is such a great career and opportunity. And I, again, I try not to label things of like, and especially if I start thinking, well, did I make it? I'm like, then I, I'll, I'll tailspin and be like, no way. Well, then you it's know, like, like uh, I, it's like, you might lose, not you, but like the general you, like you might lose that hunger. If yeah, you're like, I did yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. then it's like, what's next? If you don't have a what's next, it's hard to stay motivated. I've noticed this. I'm curious. You big sports fan? Yeah. Have you noticed this is my theory? This is my like armchair expert theory. <laughs> what's up, Dax? Let's go. You, you listen to that I show? Love it. He's great. Great show. Yeah. Probably where I got that phrase from. Um, I've noticed when a, I'm a big NBA fan, when they get a max contract, I don't feel that like the performance gets better. I feel like it almost always gets oh, worse. Oh, I totally agree. Almost always gets worse. Now, you might say the young- Where's the motivation? The young Kevin Garnett might be the exception. He made like $210 million, yeah, yeah, like yeah. 20 years old or something. Yeah. He's a, but he's a different beast. Yeah. But yeah, you're 24, 28, and you got 100, you two, go? 300 million dollars. It's like, that's made it. To, I mean, if you're talking financially at the very least, and yeah. if even if you think of your status as an NBA player, you, yeah. you, to even get that contract, you have to have been like an all-star, maybe an MVP. Right. So you've got the accolades. You don't need a championship. Then yeah, you got the big that. check. You, then you get a huge check. It's kind of like, I'm just getting paid to be here. Yeah. Where's that hunger come from? So yeah. I love the, the mentality of like, I haven't made it because I wasn't here to be like, hey, you're done, by the way. You can <laughs> God, hang up no. your, hang it up. But like, no I do think, and it's a thing that's been on the show, is kind of like one acknowledging your own success because sometimes we don't give ourselves the time and credit yeah. to just stop for a moment and embrace it and accept it, give ourselves a little bit of love totally. and then be like, okay, I'm gonna finish this bottle and then in the morning I'm gonna go get back after yeah, it again. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Totally, so, totally. I, look, I'm not good at that. I mean, I think a lot of us are not good, good no. at that, giving us, you know, taking a moment and celebrating. Like, and you know, we all have stuff to work on, we do. you know, and it never, it never ends. The work never ends, it never ends. And there's always things to get better at. Yeah. You know, I think, I just feel like I've been, as a result of caring very deeply about my my connections and the relationships that I've built and the network that I've created, um, I put a lot of time and effort into it. Like I'm the person on Facebook giving everybody the happy birthdays. Yeah. When I'm at 5,000 connections and I can't get yeah. any more, I'm like, Every day I'm like, happy birthday, happy birthday. I haven't done a great job of that lately because I'm just you know, a little distracted, but it's like, you got to put in the effort. You got to put in the work for it. Like you can't just expect things to come to you. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and to me, that, that's always, there's, there's always been so much value in that, right? 100%. And um, it's because it's just like even in sales, like when you start to focus on a certain industry or a certain geography, certain region, you like, you, you start to build your yeah. Rolodex, mm -hmm. right? OG days where we actually had physical Rolodex, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I got all these people. And it's like, when people start moving around, you're like, okay, I have these relationships, and then maybe they can make introductions. Yeah. And so that always happened to me because I built the connections and the relationships, and then I, was, I would make the asks, and yeah. I got a lot out of that. So I'm like, I'm paying this all forward. Paying well, this all forward. It goes back to the, like, the deposits, which like a lot of yes. people operate of like, what do I get out of this? Now we all oh, operate yeah. on a little bit uh, on some level of self-interest, right? Like we do, but we know people it's like, eh, it's not anything for me. I won't make a move, but you might hear something today. And in a year you hear something else and go, I could connect those two people. And that would make them better. That would totally. make them happier. And that, then you're like, I get something from that. It's not a withdraw, right? It's just that fulfillment. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, I think the other thing is you also have to recognize like, what does fulfillment mean for you? Yeah. Like what is, 
I love this. Like this shit, I love all day long. I don't think two we get real enough people, of it. two real people having a meaningful conversation, getting to know each other, and and sharing. Like this is this is great. 100%. I'm also, by the way, a professionally trained actor, so I love being really. You know, yeah, yeah, that's something else a lot of people don't what? know either. Yeah. Um. So I cameras, microphone, like this is my jam. I'm, I mean, you're in the jam. zone, clearly. Like, this is my and jam. it's funny because <laughs> it was like the the premise of the show was like we, we were talking. You know, I say backstage was like. Not another tips and tricks. Yeah, uh, totally. Or Chris, Chris Merrill, our, our mutual friend, you know, uh, he, he says uh, tips, tricks, and dopamine hits. Yeah. And I'm like, good. there's enough of that. Yeah. And so I wanted this show to be relatable. Yeah, yeah. And we'll get to marketing in a few minutes here, but I'm like, you can get that anywhere, kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. and you can literally use totally. Chad GPT or just another podcast. Or just, or just Google it. Be like, hey, okay, what's what should be my conversion rates from stage one to stage two at this ACV? Boom, done. It's okay, cool. There. I got it. It's out there. And yeah. so the premise of the show, which I'm glad you appreciate and reciprocate, is like I think people want connection and yeah. validation. Yeah, yeah. They want to hear other yeah. people's stories because yep. it's we feel alone a lot of times, and we don't know is this a normal way to feel? Should I experience this, and or should I be feeling this way about this experience? And then you hear people from different walks of life where you look up to, you know, uh, the VC or the marketing guy. And it's like, oh, they have imposter syndrome. Oh, oh they yeah. are still figuring oh, it out. Yeah. Like that was like why I'm like, I kind of wanted to press you on the made it a little bit. Not to I wanted your honest reaction, but I had a feeling you would not be like, yeah, I have. No way. But but I wanted yeah. that. I wanted people yeah, to hear. Yeah. I wanted to hear it selfishly. Yeah. And I'm like, I wanted people <laughs> to hear that. Yeah. Are so you kidding me? Like, no way. I don't even know what that is going to look like. Like I think I, it's like, just I'm a, look, I'm a recovering workaholic and I'm always going to be in recovery. Yeah. I and mean, that's the thing. I love working. I love like even if I won the lottery, I'd be like, "Cool. I'm going to start I'm going to start a foundation. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'm going to buy buildings. I'm going to, yeah. you know, house women in abuse abusive relationships cuz they they can't get credit and they can't get jobs and I'd be like, you know, like I got a whole list of things that I would do. I would yeah. not stop. I just have too much energy. Too much that I want to share. Too much left too much in the tank. Do. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Um, I'm going to ask a question that you don't have to answer. But Great. technically, all these questions you don't have to answer. We can cut Fair it point. Close. Fair point. When I um, I was reading, uh, I think it's Mamba Mentality, I think is the book. It's the Kobe, one of the Kobe Bryant books. Yeah. And, you know, you're going through it and, and you look at Kobe, he's the greatest of all time or pending your generation, the greatest of all time. <laughs> yeah. And so... In Controversial my, statement, but get you it. You know what I mean. He, yeah, he's yeah, in course. the conversation. Of course, it's undeniably is. one of the of top course. ten players of all time. Of course. And a lot of people want to be great, think they want to be great, but they don't understand the sacrifices that it takes to reach a level of success. Yeah. I'm curious, what have you sacrificed to get to where you are in your career? Gosh, um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be a little flippant here, but. Um, there's a part of me that doesn't really know. Oh, well, I mean, just wow. Okay, you don't have to answer. No, no, I, I, I. It's not that it's hard. It's just like I don't like to look at things as like, oh, this was a sacrifice. This to mm. me was a choice. And so, sure. and so, as it's like choice. to me, like sacrifice is like, oh, I'm losing out on something. I tend to be way too positive and be like, cool. I'm choosing to go to go have this experience. Yeah. If I spend energy over here of like what I'm not gaining or what yeah. I'm losing, then I'm spending too much time in the darkness and I'm, that's just not how I'm wired. I like so like I, don't, I don't really look at sacrifices. I can tell you, um, like for example, 2023, I spent 185 nights in a hotel room because I was commuting between LA and San Francisco wow. and that's not sustainable, Yeah. right? So it took at the end of the year to be like, yeah, more hotel, more nights in a hotel than in my own house. That's not okay. I don't want to keep doing that. So I've got to make yeah. some adjustments. What does that look like? Right. So like, how do I, do I always have to go up? And, I want like, this. like, do I want to keep doing like, so, yeah. so, so, you know what I mean? Rather than like, Oh, I sacrificed all this time with my wife and my family, which I, I understand you could easily look at that and be like, yep, there you go. There's a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, no, nah, I chose to do this. And you know, would I choose it again? Maybe not. Maybe I need to make a different choice. Yeah. So I don't, I guess I, the word to me is a little, it's a little loaded. Yeah, it is. And the word I don't want and I don't like the biggest, like what's your biggest regret is I think kind of like the next level of yeah, that, yeah, yeah, totally. but that's not what I'm trying to ask because for me, it's like 
with Kobe, going back to Kobe, he's like, I don't have friends. Like he straight up says, I don't have friends. But he, that was a choice that he made. He made a choice to get up every morning that's and what work I'm out. Like he made a choice to like say, focus and not go out. And that's cool. Yeah. Right. I, but I some people look a, at that as a sacrifice. He looks I do. at it as a choice. But I think it's a, so I guess maybe the word and the phrase I have used is an intentional sacrifice, which is okay. I'm choosing yeah. to not do that thing because yeah. I want this thing. And so I think it's a reflection of intentionality yeah. and commitment. And I tell people all the time, cause they're like, you know, you have two kids and you've got the career and you've got this, like, how do you do it all? And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't have it all figured out to be very clear. Yeah. <laughs> so like, so just to be clear, what yeah. you see is not what I feel. So yeah. for one, oh, yeah. and two, I have friends that I don't hang out with all that much. And yeah. that's an intentional sacrifice I'm willing to do. Yeah. And so I was just curious for you. And it wasn't like, you know, what was the big regret? It's just like, yeah. we all, in my opinion, have to make choices that come with Pros, exactly. That's that's why when I saw the tattoo, I'm like, man, I wasn't, I was gonna not hide them, but my tattoos would have been covered if yeah. I had a jacket picked out. And uh, Doug says, no, nah, we're going tattoos out today. And then I learned about choice, and I'm like, if I don't yeah. ask about sacrifice, you know what I mean? Even yeah, like yeah, if we yeah, don't totally. use this in the in the in the thing, I'm like, I gotta yeah. ask because I'm genuinely curious yeah. about, you know, people I look up to. Like, what have you given up? So, so I appreciate the way you answered it. The thing that I'll say is like, I'm a linguist at heart. Words are incredibly powerful agree more. and, and, and that's why I, I choose more positive words versus negative words. And I think a lot of times we just get comfortable with words. We get comfortable with gossip. We get comfortable mm. with, with negativity because maybe that's part of our, our, our environment that we're surrounded by. And you, and you gotta, what you have to take stock of is how does that affect you yep. and impact you? I don't like to look at things that I I'm losing, so to speak, because yeah. that's like, well, I don't, did I even have it in the first place? Yeah. I want to look at like opportunity. I want, I'm just like, I'm just weirdly wired to be incredibly positive. And I, don't know where that, I don't know where that comes from. People, my friends have asked me, they're like, dude, how did that? I'm like, I have no idea. It's just literally how I'm wired. I and, that. but I also recognize that I also have a choice. Does yeah. I have a brother who is the exact opposite? Glass, One, glass half empty. Oh yeah. There's no glass. Victim, black, you know, dark, like, like, like everything is interestingly enough too. Again, more things that people don't know about me. So when we were in high school, um, we were going to like prom. He's 11 months older than I am. Um, and there's a photo of the three of us, my mom in the middle, and I'm in an all white tuxedo and he's in an all black tuxedo. Like kind of like one picture kind of says. One picture is like, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. interesting. Um, okay, well, let's uh, let's let's flip it to more positive. And I, and I didn't mean to get negative. I just it's think not it negative. Is, yeah, it's I, not. I don't, it's just kind of how I see things. And yeah, and like, and, but I appreciate it, you know why? Because while I am invested in this intentional sacrifice concept, I'm not here to uh, convince you of it. Yeah. And there's this thing from um, I, I'm here to like maybe it changes my perspective. Yeah. Like I'm gonna go home tonight, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm gonna be driving back to the East Bay and go maybe maybe thinking of it this way isn't the best way. It's a better way than what I was, but it's a stepping stone to another way to think about yeah. it. So I'm curious, I have one I have one in the chamber, but I'm curious, what is your like, is there any other ways of like self-talk that you're rewiring your brain this year? Or maybe in the like oh. recent, you know what I mean? Like I used to say or think this way and I'm like going this other way to be more positive or treat myself with more grace. I think, I think, um, yeah, there's a, I mean, I wake up every morning and try and, focus on an intention, which is just like some clarity, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, with ease. And, and so I try to be really intentional when I wake up in the morning. I think the word that, that to me resonates just more clearly is just intentional yeah. and less about the sacrifice piece. So I just want to be super intentional. And then I, and I meditate every morning and that gets me grounded because I got a lot of energy so I can be all over the place. <laughs> and I find when I don't, then I'm like, yeah. I make weird decisions and I'm not, and I'm not thoughtful about it. And, um, and I think this year is just like, I'm like hyper focused on being present because when you're present, you, you, you experience life more fully for sure. And I think what I found in 2023 is I was going through the motions a lot mm -hmm. in life, going through the motions and, um, I wasn't in a real, I wasn't in a good place. And even now people are see me, they're like, Whoa. Like what, what's changed? And it's like, well, I've been doing a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and I'm much more intentional about how I show up every day. And I'm not just going through life like in, in a very rote fashion. 
And so um, I think just part of it is just being more mindful. Also, the, uh, another word that's really important to me this year is perspective. Like at every single moment, moment, every day, you have a choice of nine different perspectives you can choose in that moment. Mm. Think about that. Like, so like, yeah. oh, this sucks. It's raining. Well, that's one perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's one perspective. Yes, it is raining outside, but I also have another perspective, which is actually makes it really cool and kind of kind feels, of nice, right? We like this, a warm, feels cozy, this vibe, kind yeah, of cozy, right? Yeah. Like with some wine, it's like it's kind of cool with like the glow of the lights. For so sure. that's another perspective. Yep. For right. Sure. And so, like, we have choices in the matter of what perspective we choose in those moments. And so, I'm just this year. I've just been reminded that these this is what we get to do and i'm just letting go of trying to control things and I love it. surrendering to what the universe has in store for me and 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 kind of excited about that i love that man there's this part of uh did you i don't know if you're uh, a fan of uh matthew mcconaughey dude love do you like, love him i love i'm kind of in love i mean with him. i'm a little in love you, know, you know what's really interesting is like matthew i like we we're similar in many ways like yeah like, like if you listen to it, it people have said this and i and i listened to green lights i didn't read the book i listened to it and i listened to it when I'm, I'm like one it's him talking and i love that and two i'm like dude some of the things he says i say and i'm like mm. and some people have said that and i was like oh whatever dude he's yeah he's at a whole nother level i'm like no i get it like i'm we I'm a total wannabe Southern like aristocrat. <laughs> like I love the South. I got boots on. I noticed the uh, boots. You're like you know, um, I just I, I appreciate his like his like soulfulness, his honesty, 100%. his groundedness. He's like, dude, I don't I haven't gotten it all right, but I've made I've made mistakes, and he owns it. And he's like, yeah, this is kind of part of the journey, right? I, so I love him. So yes, I'm not answer I'm, your question. I'm yes. trying so hard not to interrupt you of yeah, like my yes, joy because. I get it. I love Matthew McConaughey, which like, yes, 10, 20, 50 million people just agreed with me. Yeah. But his book, <laughs> I tell everyone, don't read it. Listen, listen to, to it. it. Yes. Because if you don't like listening to it, you shouldn't even bother reading it because yeah. it's just such a better version of it. Yeah, yeah. So I've listened to it a couple of times. I wonder if that's somewhere I am getting match vibes because it came up to me. <laughs> but the, and I, re I reread it again at the end of last year. I re-listened to it again because some of the stuff I was going through, I was like, I need a friend. I need to pick yeah, me up right now. Yeah, and I need totally. an on demand yeah. positivity. And the quote, you, you remember, oh dude, it's, it's so admirable. But there's a quote where, um, I think he was like, I want to say Africa, but he was talking to some guys and there, there, there was like an argument and he was like, yeah, I think so-and-so is right. And they stopped him and they're like, it's not about being right. It's yeah. about understanding his perspective. Yep. Amen. And that change, like he stops, you know, he kind of stops and, and then so that's echoing in my head right now where I'm like kind of all in on this, like I need to be cautious with my sacrifices and I get Doug Landis day, like just another way to think about it is choices. Mm -hmm. And so like, to me, that's cool. That's really cool that's to me awesome. because I have about 10 bullets on my phone right now of things we could have talked about and mm -hmm. we have not talked about any of them yet. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, like, yeah, I think that's cool. a cool thing. Cool. So it's I just cool. want to say like, well, that's, look, I mean, that's a benefit, you know, you're, you're, you're easy to talk to. Um, and that is a gift. Uh, Devin, you have it. You have a you have a Appreciate way that. you have a way of connecting with people. I mean, I I didn't really know you before we I decided to just do this, and I'm like, there's something about him. I feel like I'm a really good judge of character. That's one of the things that I've developed over time. Maybe it's a gift. I don't know. But there was something about you. I'm like, you're 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 real. You're Appreciate not a BSer. That. You're not like you're not trying to game the system and game people. You're real, and I was like, mm, I'm, I'm curious what this all. And I was like, what are you going to talk about? I'm like, I have no idea. I have no <laughs> idea, but I'm going to like have a conversation and just see, see what, see what unfolds. And and it's appreciate that, man. It's, yeah, it's it's been cool. It's been very cool. Well, so I appreciate a lot. And the reason I started with like reputation, why? Well, one is yours and my perspective on or perception of it. But you said something before where you were like, I got the invite from Chris. So Chris, our friend, you know, he's like, hey, do you want to do Devin's show? And you said I turned around and asked John if I should do this. I did. And so the well, fact no, no, hold on a second though. I, I wasn't should I do this. It was oh. more like, hey, is it worth doing? No, yeah, no, 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 oh. no. It wasn't that. So, so John and I are working on our own little project. Yeah. yeah. And and I was like, what, what? Like, do you care? I was more like, oh, John, do you okay, care? Because okay. John and I are working on something. I'm like, do you care? Yeah. Because I, like I don't because I did again I didn't have any context sure, sure. of what this was. Um, <laughs> Note to self. I, yeah, yeah, write a little more context. Right. I mean, <laughs> look, look honestly, it's because of my history with John and Chris. Yeah. And and my kind of loose understanding of you that I was like, all right, I'm totally willing to take a risk. I appreciate on that. this. And and so it wasn't so much like should I do this. It was more like it's like kosher. Are, are there any issues? Yeah. yeah. Right. Because I'm I'm conscious of like I don't want to you know 
step on any toes. I don't, I didn't think it was going to, but I just want another perspective. Yeah, right? for sure. Right? No, I, I, I thought it was like, uh, so I misread it, but I was like, how cool that I got back channeled and passed, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, you know, and that's the thing. And that's why I was like, kind of trying to come full circle. I was like, here's this dude who does has no need to come and talk to me and hang out, but you know, decided to do so. Well, I want to, there are some things that you have done and said that I'm curious about. Yeah, please. Can I get some wisdom from you? for myself and my listeners on the on the marketing side a little bit. Sure, sure. So um, you had said on a podcast, which I'm so aware of what I'm doing, which is like, hey, remember that thing you said a year and a half ago? I'm going to do some gotcha journalism. Oh, no, gosh, no way. It was, it was a safe, it's a safe one. I would never do that. Um, That's okay, was, by the way. I don't care because I don't claim any perfection. So it's all, I'll own it. No, you know what? I did this one time. Do you know Dave Gerhardt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marketing guy. I did this like, I don't know, four years ago. And I was researching for him on my on the on the different podcast. And I uh, I started with that. And I was like, hey, what, you said this thing on a podcast one time. And he lit me up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> he was like, yeah, yeah. well, I did say that, but I like the context was different. Right. And he did not like the way I teed it up. Right, right, right. And so I was like, all right, note to self, they don't like that opening. But I said it to you because it was a podcast you'd done recently and I liked what you said, which was like for sales, we're going from like basically growth at all costs era to smart selling. Yep. My brain went to, I wonder what Doug's marketing version is of that, that from Ooh, two. That's interesting. So from growth, Super you know, again, growth at all costs to smart selling. I know I'm totally putting a spot, but there's no right or wrong answer. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, there's a slight correction to, to that because I think I think the, 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 the shift was, we're shifting, we, we, we have to move from growth at all costs to a much more efficient way of growing, right? So it, it's more about efficiency, Okay. Um, which if you're gonna, building a business, it, I would argue it's smart. I agree. So, so yes, and the title said smart, so, but I will agree. No, I agree with you. I'm saying the oh, guy. Oh, you're right. It actually, it did say it in the title. It but I listened that, to it and I know it was efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and I should have led with that. It's much more about efficiency. I should have, I should have yeah, yeah. said, so oh, Doug, so Doug you, you, you had a great pot. <laughs> <clears throat> So you had a great podcast and you said, we got to go from uh, growth at all costs to efficient selling or efficient growth. Yes. I'm curious, what is the marketing version of that in your eyes? Ooh, um, well, here's, here's a little context to this response. The context is I am not as uh, astute in the um, marketing metrics associated with like cost per lead, cost per click, cost per kind of marketing activities. Sure. So, so it's a little harder for me to um, have a perspective because I don't, I, don't, I don't dig into the data or the numbers okay. on the marketing side as much on the sales side. I do think though, from a marketing perspective, we are at a place right now where it feels like we need to be more thoughtful on both our brand and our purpose and what we stand for mm -hmm. um, and be way more considerate about how people perceive it because I, I, I think I think brand really matters today. People want to work with brands that actually have meaning and have purpose mm -hmm. and have some kind of meat behind or some wood behind the arrow, so to speak. Um, I think the other thing from a marketing perspective that's really important is um, we need to have more targeted, meaningful conversations as a marketer with a with an individual. So, I think in many cases, marketing is very much a kind of spray and pray. We're going to, you know, we're going to like, we're marketing to the masses, yes, right? And yes. from there, we're going to funnel them and filter them and get down to the, like the gold nuggets of the potential targets, right? right? And then yeah. we're going to run them through a sales process. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. And it, and it, and it, it's too, it, it aligns too much with the spray and pray mentality that we've had in the SDR domain, yeah. right? Which is like, oh, I'm just going to go after anybody and everybody. The, the irony is, is like ABM is, is actually not new. It was strategic selling and marketing, you know, 20 years ago. Sure. It's just a different it's better word. better acronym. It's, it, right, it's, a better, it's a way better acronym. <laughs> but it's really about being targeted and it's really about knowing you, Devin. Yeah. Like, you, okay, you like basketball. Okay, like, you know, you used to live in Sacramento. Okay, like, what do I know about you that I can connect our brand and our value proposition to? Mm -hmm. It requires just being a bit more thoughtful. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it also requires looking at marketing from a different lens, which is I don't, I'm not gonna measure marketing on leads, contacts, whatever you wanna call them. Yeah. I wanna measure marketing on revenue. Let's talk about that. 
Yeah, let's, let's get talk it. about let's it. Let's get it. Let's, let's get talk. it. You, you mentioned something in, oh, uh, let's get it. in the green room. Let's get it. And I got excited and I, it took everything not to dig in then and to, to find a way to yeah, weave that back to yeah, now. Yeah. But this so, is, but it's connected, right? It's like, look, here's the thing. I don't want 10,000 leads. I want a hundred that convert higher. I want a hundred that are deals. a better fit that by the way, are likely going to stay and they're going to be happy and they're going to work with us. And they're going to give us, they're, they're going to give us referrals and they're going to be advocates and they're going to renew and they're going to expand. Yeah. I want those people. And, and so marketing, your job is to figure out of those 10,000, who are those 100? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying market to all 10,000. I'm saying go figure out who those 100 right. are and then let's go market to them. 100%. Because I think the incentive structure is a little screwed up on the marketing side. And yep. so if you want to talk about this, the shift from growth at all costs to efficiency, it's like, let's change the incentive structure for let's, marketers. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so I'm going to be, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I might I'm piss some people off here, but like, Hey, uh, it's, if if, if, you, if you know me and if you know Doug, <laughs> I'm not immune to uh, to doing that. Opinions. I say I say some people are immune to my charm, uh, and, and sometimes my perspectives. Yeah. So it's interesting because when I was at Gong, it was the so I had two I've had two uh, marketing leadership roles in B two B. One was at Gong, and it was growth at all costs era. Yo, and yeah, one nice. right now is Clary, which is efficient growth era. Yeah, yeah. And the irony is the brand and the DNA of those companies matched that mentality. Yep. Totally. Go, 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 be big, be loud, go yep, get it done. Yep, yep. Go to Clary and it's like slower, more methodical efficiency. You know what go. you want to know is something really interesting? <laughs> Always. I, I know both CEOs and founders really well and yeah. it matches each one of them. Oh, meet is like- 100%. It's like, oh, I got this massive opportunity. And, and I met him before Gong was ever in the United States. He asked so me- So 2016 me, probably? Yeah. Back then? That's oh, a long time ago. Oh, before that, oh, you're talking about like before you even started it. Before you even started, it was oh, an idea. Wow. Oh, yeah. And he yeah, was yeah. like, hey, I want you to be an advisor. And I was like, well, I was you saw like, that original pitch like, deck that really. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> uh, okay, okay, this is cool. And then I met Roy from Chorus. And, and <laughs> this is a really funny story, but like I met Roy and I was like, dude, I already know a bunch of people that are already doing this. I don't know what you're doing. And he was like, oh, no, but I, I just want to tell you about it. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah. And then, by the way, Emergence invested in Chorus. Mm -hmm. It was Effect Layer at the time, and so then I my one of my first meetings when I got to Emergence was a meeting with Roy. I was like, "No way! Look at you! Oh, you <laughs> we like get you to work it. together." Yeah. I didn't even know, right? Wow. So I, unfortunately, I couldn't work with Gong because we had already invested in Chorus. And of what course. Have you. But Amit is that way, and I know Andy over at Clary because I helped him build Clary in the early days. Wow. That was one of their their very 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 first like design partners. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, and it was like a it was like a it was a mobile opportunity management platform that yeah. we bought that oh, i bought really? and it totally failed oh, really? <laughs> failed yeah and it helped them to pivot to this to this like rev ops forecast yeah. and now they're like really expanding and i and i love it but andy is very methodical and he's thoughtful and he's like yeah okay we want to be smart about this yeah. it was interesting because we, it, you know gong was my first rodeo in the in the marketing world and so it was it was go 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 grow as fast Crazy. as you can yeah. and it was very successful yeah and then going over to Clary, I was saying is like, um, you know, more methodical, but the way that the teams compensate the marketing department and the way that they measure is very different. So Ooh, tell me more about that. We will bleep. I'm going to tell you all because we're vibing. We'll yeah. bleep anything that's too, you know, too, yeah. too telling. But we did something at, at Gone that was interesting, which as a previous salesperson, I loved. Okay. Which was... The marketing team, and I was on demand gen, I was content under demand gen, so you know, the performance marketing, whatever. Right. Which by the way, the whole team is a performance marketing team. Yeah, I hate I, the I idea hate that the title, some yeah. people are performance, the other ones are not. Right. Like, <laughs> I was like, I don't get that. And what do you mean growth market? Like, we're all growing the company, right, so, right, but right, I, you right, know, totally. that's semant semantics, but words matter. Words semantics, matter. but word matter. Yeah. But what they did was, um, let's say my goal, I'm just gonna use like S1, you know, S0 opportunities, like net new opportunities, whatever. Let's say that was my metric. If I had a hundred percent, but our revenue target was ninety yeah. percent, my multiplier was 0.9. Makes sense. And the That's thing great. that they I wanted mean, to have I loved it. By, by, by the way, it's because you know, all the stuff that you're putting in the top of the funnel isn't converting necessarily. And so, like, you can't have a situation where marketing is crushing it. That's exactly and the company what, is not hitting their revenue numbers. Like, and a lot of people didn't like it on marketing. And the and I I said, how is that unfair? Cause, cause you no, know, no, you know, you also have like, there's a delay, right? Marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. can do a bunch of great stuff. And then the yeah. next quarter it translates. Totally. So I totally. get that, but I liked it because one, it drove accountability. Yep. And two, it was like what they want. They said, they're like, we don't want the marketing team to be celebrating while the sales team is not celebrating. Amen. And the whole goal is for the company to grow. Yes. And Amen. so I went, 
look, there was some times, you know, mostly great. If anything, we got accelerators and life was good. Yeah. There was a couple of times where it was like, you didn't quite, you know, we didn't quite hit a hundred percent and people were kind of pouty. And I'm like, how's like, we're a team. By the way, that's exactly what happens on the sales side. But, well, like, that's what I'm saying. I like, mean, like, I don't so get why, why do you get paid and we're, we're struggling over here. Yep. And, and, and I think part of it goes back to control. Because marketers mm. worry about the fact like, oh, I just generated this contact. I found this contact. I found this lead, whatever. I got some, I got some response. I threw yep. it over the fence. I don't control it anymore. And, and this yep. is where a lot of the tension between marketing and sales comes from. It's yeah. like, I can't control what they do. And marketing's like, well, they, marketing's like, the reps suck. They don't know it. We're sending <laughs> them all the good leads, right? The Glenn Gary leads. And they can't <laughs> close the bad ones. So why are we going to give them the good ones yeah. kind of thing? And it's like, well, you like, you, you got to, you got to remove that judgment yes because if you haven't done that sorry shut the hell up like if you haven't been a rep and because I, I don't care i can look I, at i can I, look yeah. at your lead and be like you think this is like an a plus lead i've had a conversation with him and it's like a b yeah right so let's just get let's just talk about that yeah instead of pointing the fingers the point finger pointing it sucks and if you change the incentive structure and say guess what we're all going to get comped on closed yes. revenue and net dollar retention then we all have a vested interest in in like the, prog the progression. If you have two metrics or two goals, then you have two teams. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ooh, goodness. I like that. If you have, so I'm like, we're all responsible for revenue. Yeah. I might be accountable for a certain part of like, yeah. I got to get Doug and his sales team to this, you know, number of S zeros, which is like new, net new opportunities, just using that as an, yep. a current example. Yep. And then your team is responsible or accountable, whatever word you want to use, to getting it to close run. But yeah. we all we only both win if yes. it gets to the finish line. Totally, totally. And so by what, the way, can I ask things, you a question? Yeah, but hold on a second though. Think about this. If things aren't converting at the same clip that we need them to convert in order for us to get to that number, that's when we all have the conversation. What's happening? Exactly. Like that instead of like, oh, we send you all these leads and sales like, dude, half your leads weren't great. And it's like, no, let's just dig into what's happening, what's different. Just yeah. Keep tracking that. And just have really honest conversations about what we think might be happening. By the way, it could be a whole number of things. It, it is. And having done these exercises, and I'm sure you have been part of those, the bubble up conversations. Like if I'm having the conversations, they bubble up to like your level. It's almost always a little bit of both. Of course. It's not just sales not doing their job. It's not just marketing, creating bad leads. It's always like two things of each department. Like, no, no. There's Good. eight other things. That well, yeah, I was being a little. But that, yeah, no, but, but that's, you know what I mean. But that's the thing. Everyone just thinks it's either sales execution or marketing's targeting the wrong people. By the way, it could be a product issue. It could be a market issue. It could be you know, it could be pricing and packaging, new competitor. It could be yes. just the e economy. It could be that you know we've got an election coming up and that's screwing everything. Like there's so many factors. I think it's important to just take a step back and go, yeah. okay, let's look at what, what's in front of us and let's also pull back. Yeah. And go. What else might be happening? Can you answer this for me? <laughs> I, don't I hope so. I so and again, I'm very mindful of like the way you first learn something, you kind of like get cemented in, right? Like that's the way it should be done. So I'm trying to, you know, I don't know what the blank bias is, you know, yeah. like original original bias or something. But we agreed just now that it should be its revenue, right? And you have separate, you know, different metrics. Why don't more companies do that? <sighs> That's a really you good see question. a lot. That's I'm a just really one guy question. at one company, and I'm no, looking at you like Doug. You have the vision. Why aren't like I, I find it so, wild that it's not more normalized in the majority? Yeah, I think I think part of it boils down to just history. Like everyone is just it's like we've done it this way, so we're just gonna keep doing it this way, and everyone's just nor it's comfortable with it. By the way, with a lot of early product and engineering -led, engineering led founders, they're just basically like do it the way it's always been done. Right, because we don't understand the go-to-market side, so we're hiring people. Do it and the safe. People, and, do the hiring, and the people that we're hiring, by the way, that's what they know. Yeah. Right. So it's, and I think it's also a way in which. So here's the thing: if you're measuring marketing based on on and even customer success, by the way, based on revenue and net dollar retention, um, how do you know if you have the right people? How do you know? Like, you need other metrics, and so people are like, "I need a way to measure you, Devin." Of course. I need a way to determine like whether or not like you've got the right incentive structure, you're doing your job, whether you're good or bad or what have you. And unfortunately, I think we get too caught up in that. Yeah. And we don't take a step back and go, well, what if we created a, a cohesive organization? For example, SDRs. Yeah. <laughs> Just gonna throw this out there. Quit paying them 50-50. Pay them 90-10. Base Make heavy? them full base. Just pay them 100% and make them a part of the sales team. Don't, because guess what? The incentive structure right now causes them to just focus on meetings, and most of the meetings are 
mediocre. So you're saying base salary, 90% base, so like get them paid. And yeah, then 10%, 10 percent is on like OKRs. Like like activity? Okay. Uh, we gotta define what those OKRs yeah. are. Like part of its meetings, part of its activities, part of its research, okay. meaningful interactions. You know, okay. look, if 10 to 12 people are involved in every buy every buying decision, you know what happens yeah. with SDRs? They focus on one person, maybe two. I wanna know who the other 10 are. Yeah. And I wanna know everything about them. Right. So go do the research on all the people that I need to know and help me develop a strategy to get out and to get out in front of them and reach them. Right. And that's an SDR and a marketing yeah. exercise. Right. Sure. So if I'm going to have a hypothesis about a company that I'm going to go sell to marketing, help me build a hypothesis. Yeah. Quick, quick hot take. Yeah. SDRs on marketing or should they always be under sales? Or is it, I know I'm hitting with an always, but I'm curious, yeah, you, you I, lit I, up I, at SDR. So I'm like wondering if there's like a, I should... mean, look, I, I, I'm a sales professional wrapped in a marketer's body that cares more about customers than most customer success of chief customer success officers do. Um, I like SDRs to live under sales. Yeah. That's just me personally. Mm -hmm. um, I understand the value of living under marketing, but the problem is, is when marketing has a separate number, they're over in a silo over here and SDRs are like, well, hey, we're kind of part of the sales team, but we're kind of under this marketing domain. So we got to do what they say. Yeah. And it's like, then it creates more tension. Yeah. I'm thinking of my listeners and always, uh, I'm thinking of listeners and, and honestly for myself, like what can marketers do to become more valuable at their organization with the lens of what we're talking about? Because I think a lot of times there are hungry marketers who want to do what we're talking about, right? Yep. But maybe, I don't know, it's just the structure of their company. Maybe they're below the power line, right? So I'm just kind of thinking like, so I'm a, I'm a director level, so I'm right in the middle. I, yeah. I joke I'm Michael Scott of, uh, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of tech, you know? That's a uh, good one. So, um, but I'm looking for ways like, you know, whether I go be an executive one day or not, like the fact that I'm thinking this way is like, I don't want to just be the MQL guy. Mm. Because because you can game it. Once I learned, by the way, that it's yeah. just someone in demand gen deciding what an MQL is, totally is. you can turn that lever and, up and, or that knob down. Uh, by the way, that's a problem. Someone in that is a problem. What you just someone in demand gen deciding what an MQL is problem. Yeah, that it's like a, deciding what your well, money's huge, worth and printing money. Yeah, it's a huge issue right there. Someone yeah. like no, we need to have massive agreement on what is an MQL, what is an SQL, what is what is SAO, what is what does it mean and what does it matter and yeah. what do we need to be doing and what are we tracking and and what what are we expecting from a prospect to be doing? Like all that needs to be defined at the strategy level and then yeah. the, then we all need to continue to to evaluate it and reevaluate right. it, reevaluate it. Um again, MQL. So I'm just cranking out MQLs because I'm getting paid on cranking out MQL. So guess what? You know, we all game the system. AEs well, game the system. SDRs game. We all game the system because what are we trying to do? We're just trying to get paid. So yeah. what if we what if we do start creating comp plans that are like 90 tens, 80 20s? Yeah. Right. AEs gonna be 80 percent, 20 percent is is a kicker, and once you get to 100 percent, then guess what? You're making a ton of money. Crazy accelerators. Right? Crazy. Right. That's. Interesting model. Why not? Because I want you doing the work. Yeah. And you know, it, unfortunately, we just chase the things that are going to give us the the most, you know, the most variable pay. I want, I yeah. want, I want people in it for the long run. I don't want people jumping around because they're like, oh, I'm getting paid better over here. Or like, no, I'm going to create the right culture and the right comp structure that you're never going to want to leave because we're yeah. going to we're going to have fun and we're going to kill it. We're all going to be making good money. Yeah. Um. Back to your back to your question though. Um. What can marketers do if you're mid level? Or in, in general, but or, I'm just, or curious, just like, in general. So, I'm curious because you've been a you've been a, you know you've been in sales. You're a VC, so it's like you you see bullshit marketing and you see great marketing. I I'm I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, I, but I like I, I've seen a lot of it. I've I mean, I also worked at really amazing companies that are are that's like bonkers, right? So I'm like, um, what do you view as like the you know what can we do to be more so viable? Take a take a page out of Salesforce's playbook, and, and I'm gonna and there's a page out of Salesforce's playbook, and then there's a pay, my own page that um, I think marketers need to pay more attention to. The reason why Salesforce is so incredibly valuable and important to their customers is because they, they demonstrate is better than almost anybody else out there that they get their customers. Mm. They are maniacally customer centric. Most marketers I see are company centric. I'm marketing my company, our yeah. products, our value. I don't care. I don't yeah. care about feeds and speeds. I care about <laughs> customers that you've helped before. Tell me that story, tell me that yeah. narrative, pull those companies, pull those personas, 
pull their scenario, pull their current state, what they had before, what they're doing now, extrapolate that information and use that in the conversation, yeah. use that in your brand, use that in your materials, use that in your marketing. Because you know what, as a buyer, I connect with that. Yep. I don't connect with your company name and your brand and your value proposition because it's all the same. Everyone says the same shit, yep. right? So like, give me that customer perspective and they do an amazing job of that. Go to Dreamforce, all customer testimonials. Yeah. Everywhere, Everywhere. right? Customer, customer. Every time on stage, 10 customers. Mark talks a little bit, 10 customers. Yeah. Right? I was gonna say- That's I, one thing we can do. I was gonna say, because uh, one of the questions we were kind of talking about was like, what do sales leaders really want from marketing? And I'll tell you, if there's one thing of all of all my marketing roles and interaction with sales leaders, I want more voice of the customer. Oh gosh. Number one thing. Do you agree with it? I, yeah. 100%, like more of that. Which is also why I think customer success is one of the most undervalued parts of any organization because they're close to the customer. They yep. understand in their words what value means, what we're doing, what what we're not able to do. Like yeah. they need to feed that back into marketing. Marketing needs to do something with that knowledge yeah. and institution. I think the other thing that's really important that marketing can do is, look, I fundamentally believe in having a hypothesis and a point of view in every conversation you go into. Mm. I'm going to write a book about what I call hypothesis selling, which is which is like. I want, if, if, if one of my reps is reaching out to a company, I want them to have a perspective about the industry, the company, the persona, the problems they might, current, they might have, and what they might often use to try and solve for said problems, right? Yep. That's how you need to prepare for a conversation. Guess what? Well, can marketing help with that? Hey, ChatGPT, what's going on in the, in the oil and gas industry? What's going on in the insurance industry right now? What's going on in this industry? Where does this company fit in? How are they yeah. growing? Are they not? Are they hiring? Are they not? What's happening? Where do they stack rank in 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 their yep. segment? So marketing build out all that all that material for me so that I can get smarter and better based on the industries and the companies that I'm calling on, yep. right? So I can have a prepared mind. Write out your hypothesis. Write out the point of view for me for every okay. persona. Yeah. Right. And oh, give me a customer story for every single persona at every stage. Guess what? That's marketing's job. Do I see marketers do it? No. Why? Because they get stuck. What? Leads. leads. I got to find leads. I got to find leads. Which yeah. I get. We need contacts. We need people to reach out to. But we also need context. Yes. Something so to say any, when you get them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the issue. We focus too much on getting them. And then we're like, reps, you figure out what to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, guess what? Reps are like, okay, cool. But like, it's going to take a lot longer. And you're marketing to them. I feel like you should know them as well and then you could share that with yep. us right so that's where the that's why I, I i don't say sales and marketing alignment i hate that phrase well it starts kind of like I got a better word. choice of word can I, I a better word what's the word integration sales and marketing are integrated yeah the right? same they're, not, they're not connected. together the we same. Have the same goal revenue net dollar retention yeah it's that little shift yeah it's crazy i love it, man well hey I would say good wine and even better company. Yeah, amen. I appreciate that. it, man. Truly, amen I'm thankful that. for your time. Thank you for sharing. This is awesome. I, I, I pushed you a little bit and I'm glad I did, but man, I'm really grateful. So thank you for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. Ooh, appreciate man. it. After our bottle of wine and tales of tattoos, I thought a lot about Doug's advice and how I'm gonna put it into action to grow my career, brand, and business. There were a lot to choose from, but here are my three favorite takeaways from Doug. Number one, the key to building a lasting career and leading a fulfilled life is not about how much money you make, it's about how many people you help. Making deposits to your network is both a smart investment and it uplifts the people around you. Number two, call it choices or intentional sacrifices, but be intentional with your decisions. Filling up one cup usually means neglecting another. There's no wrong answer, just be mindful of your choices and think long-term. And number three, Becoming a more valuable marketer is simple, but difficult. You gotta measure yourself on revenue. Easier said than done, but so is building a bigger career. All right, if you're still listening, you must really crave growth, and I respect that. And you don't have to wait until next week's episode for more marketing advice. There are three ways I can help you scale your content right now. Every Saturday morning, I publish a newsletter where you'll get content tips and strategies for growing your career, brand and business. Subscribe now to join thousands of readers. Just tap the link in the show notes. My ebook, Content That Converts, shows you how to confidently grow your reach and audience. 
This expansive digital playbook packed with tips, techniques, and examples reveals the exact strategies and step-by-step -step processes for converting attention into audience growth and sales. To buy your copy, hit the link in the show notes. You're seeing a pattern. And if you'd like to sponsor this show or partner with The Reader, email me at yo at thereader.co. Yes, that's yo at thereader.co. That's a wrap for now. And if you like the show, go ahead and give us that five-star rating on Apple. It helps us grow.